welcome to you. <clears throat> We're happy that you found God Talk and uh, that I get to have a little small slice of your spiritual time that you spend with God. So this is God Talk. I'm Pastor Dan, and we're doing a series called Big God. We have one or two more left to do. So I did this week of prayer for the Spanish church in Riverside of La Sierra every night. It's amazing how many people in the middle of this lockdown wanted to hear about God, and I call it my Big God series. Once in a while, we just need to be reminded how big God is, and he has power. We did one sermon, Yea, God, for your power. Last week, Yea, God, for being a refuge. Today, Jericho. When the walls came tumbling down. Have you ever thought of what it would be like to have just power? You could use power if something is wrong, like the Oceans movies you've seen those on television, and somebody does something wrong, tells someone else in Las Vegas, these guys go get them. And they steal from them in order to give to the people who've been stolen from. (laughs) They have the power, and they make uh, Terry Benedict give millions and millions to Oprah for a school in Africa. He didn't want to give, but they stole it and made him give it. Avatar. These people have gone to Pandora and are trying to steal resources from Pandora. And this group of people power together and they join together and they drive them out. Power. Two Christian brothers made all the Matrix movies. There's this huge Matrix all over the world. And uh, they have a lot of power, but with this small group of people with this kind of power, they were able to somehow counterbalance all the Matrix power. And we're looking at the story of Jericho. What would it be like to have that kind of power? Somebody messes with you, make their house come tumbling down. The IRS guy who tried to audit me years ago. If I could just pray a little prayer and he would go home, (laughs) his house is rubble. Every Every cop that gives me a ticket Goes home, house is rubble. Jack Clark came down from the San Francisco Giants and hit a home run against the Dodgers. We lost the series. Goes home and his mansion is now destroyed. <laughs> Don't mess with us. You have power. Reggie Jackson hit three home runs against us in the Yankees back in the World Series years ago. House destroyed. All the Houston Astros who were stealing their base, their signs for base stealing, banging on a garbage can and took our Dodger World Championship away. They all go home, houses destroyed, walls tumbling down because we have power. March around and we cry out. We, the church go to Bellagio in Las Vegas, think of that. They got gambling and they got women uh, shows that aren't very good and they're drinking and partying. This is going to stop. And we get a bunch of churches together and we march around every day. And then on Sabbath, we march around seven times and we shout. And Bellagio comes tumbling down. Or better yet, the owner says, okay, 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 I get it. Gives us Bellagio and we have a church in there now. The whole Las Vegas Strip. Churches and hospitals and schools. That's what God said to the Israelites. You go into the promised land. And I will drive out the giants. I will give that land to you. The whole story and all the stories like it, there's a question, are they true? Are the stories really real? There's a whole uh, movement, I suppose, by some people to say that these stories are great literature, they have lessons, but it really ever happened. There's no evidence about Jericho's walls come tumbling down. There's no evidence that AI ever existed. People say there's no chance that could have been a Red Sea, two million people across a Red Sea. There would be evidence walking across the desert. You leave stuff behind. So they say the stories never happened. That these are all myths and legends. 
Some people made them up in order to give their people a sense of history and the blessing of God, but it never really happened. It's just a blanket to keep you warm at night, keep you from being afraid of the dark at night. But they're not true. And then they'll say it doesn't really matter. What you need from these stories is a spiritual lesson of how to live life. It's the lesson from it. Three little pigs build a house of bricks, not straw or sticks. Doesn't really matter if there's ever a story of three little pigs and a wolf. Okay. Beauty and the beast. Power of love to change who you are. Cinderella. All these stories have a point. But there's no reality behind it. There's no historical reality. Does it matter if these stories of the Bible and Jericho's walls come tumbling down have any historical reality or not? And I would say, yes, it does matter. These are not just Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast and Three Little Pigs. If I have to choose about a, between a story about a city and the walls come tumbling down and a real God who actually did that and has the power to do that today, I choose the reality. It was a Red Sea crossing. It was a sun that stopped for Joshua. If I have to choose between a story of someone who rose from the grave and the actual reality that someone said, I will do it, and he did it, and 500 people saw him, and he says, and I have the same power to do that for you, and I can see my father again because it happened. I choose the reality. If I have to choose between a story of a Dutch girl who came over to America and the reality of Hilda, who is that girl, I choose the reality, not just the story. <laughs> So you have to choose. I choose the stories to be true in the Bible. The historical reality of the virgin birth and the resurrection and the story of the Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. Well, the next question has to be, what meaning does this have for us today? God says to the Israelites, don't accept Egypt. They're standing on the banks of the Jordan River. They're scared to go. They don't want to go back to slavery, but they don't go across. And God says to them, I'm giving you this land. Everywhere you walk will be your land. You don't have to be afraid of the giants and the walled cities. I am giving it to you. I will fight for you. I will drive them out. Just step into the water and go across. I will open up the water and go across. Does this have meaning for us today? God says, I have a promised land for you coming. Don't accept slavery. Don't accept just being a machine just like that. I have a promised land. Not just in heaven, I have a promised land here for you. But if you will just go and claim it, I will drive out the demons. I will drive out the giants. I will give you this land. You just step in and show some faith. And whatever giants are in your life, God says, I will drive them out. I will make the walls come tumbling down again. One of my favorite stories is about the young Brazilian who became an Adventist. He's so excited about his faith, he's boasting to his friends about what God has power. One of the guys in the zoo knew, he worked in a zoo. One of the guys in the zoo knew the story about the Daniel and the lion's den. He said, if you have so much faith, if you are such a spiritual giant, then let's see you do it. You get in the lion's den to see what God does. The guy said, okay, no problem. Climbs into the lion's den. Sure enough, a lion comes over, sniffs him all over, and goes back and lies down. And all the kids got baptized. They said, okay, it's true. It happened again. Can we count on that? I was in a gym one day, and a young Korean teacher who's a friend of ours came over. We were talking, and she said, Pastor Dan, I just want to tell you a couple of miracles. Her daughter, who had been a little kid growing up with our kids, uh, graduated, was going back to New York to go to school of some kind, could not find an apartment that she could afford. 
And she said, I'm praying and praying and praying. It doesn't seem to work. I'm not going to pray anymore. Prayer doesn't work, Mom. Mom said, you need to give God a deadline. Write down on a piece of paper, I need an apartment by this date for this price. Put it in your Bible, and you pray over that. Two days later, got an apartment. <laughs> she, at some point, she was going to go to Stanford to go to graduate school. Needed, I think, 5000 more dollars in order to make it to go to Stanford. Same problem. Finally, she said, tell God, give him a deadline. Okay, God, I need $5,000 for Stanford by this date. I think she met a guy random in, in a store who somehow gave her some money. Her grandmother, I think in Korea, sent her some money. And a man in Korea somehow sent several thousand dollars. I saw the text on the phone. I'm sending you some money. Walls come tumbling down. Maybe it doesn't mean that for you and I, walls come tumbling down means that we're never going to get sick. It doesn't mean we're going to get all the money in the world that we would like to have. It doesn't mean all problems will go away and this terrible virus will all be wiped out for us. But it does mean, I think, that if God puts a promised land on your heart, not just a promised land in heaven, that's for sure, but if God says, I have a destiny for you, I have a plan for you, I want you to go do this thing for God, to build the kingdom, God will do that. And God will knock down the giants and he will make the walls come tumbling down so that you can achieve that particular dream, whatever it is. I'll tell you a quick story. I had a head elder in my church at uh, Garden Grove for all the 10 years I was there. He's not well right now, so pray for him. Tom Neslin, great man, into his 80s, still working at our church full time, all the, doing everything. Great, great man. He was in charge, one of the temperance leaders in our church, and he would go around the world helping work on anti-alcohol, anti-smoking programs. And he went to a conference on alcohol and alcoholism. I forget what country. And he went to the conference, and they had to get in line or on the way in, and uh, they had tables of champagne to give. He was the first one in line, and they said uh, they were going to hand him a glass of champagne. He says, I, I don't drink. He said, could I have a glass of orange juice? He said, we don't have any orange juice. All we have is a champagne. He said, I think you have orange juice somewhere. It's an alcohol conference on, on alcoholism. So he made the whole line behind him wait while they went and found him a glass of orange juice. Five minutes. Finally, they said, okay, here, we got, found a glass of orange juice. The next one in line asked for orange juice. Almost the whole group asked for orange juice. There was a conference against alcoholism, serving champagne. And God made the walls come tumbling down again. Wow. I asked all the kids in my social entrepreneurship class at La Sierra University, what is your dream? What is your, your destiny, your promised land that you know God has offered you? Write it down. And then I said to them, what's keeping you from that promised land? What is keeping you from going for it? Procrastination, not getting in shape, bad time management, need to get closer to God. And I said to them, my friend, those are walls God can knock down. If you'll give those walls to God, God can give you the answer to those things, and you can have your promised land. God told them in Deuteronomy, I will do it. He said, don't, don't live with those giants in there. <clears throat> I don't want you to compromise and just sort of live, coexist with these, with these people. Drive them out. I will drive them out. You work with me. He says, I will drive them out. Destroy them. I was on an airplane and I watched a movie on a plane called Life of Pi. This boy... He's with his family from India on a ship in a terrible storm, and he ends up on a little life raft. And somehow some other animals are in the life raft with him, and there's a tiger. The tiger eats all the other animals. 
And now you're in a life raft with a tiger. You just can't do that. And finally, he makes a little separate raft. You can't be in this life raft. And God says to them in this promised land, don't accept the dragons. Drive them out. Don't accept whatever is keeping you from your promised land. I don't know what your promised land is. To start another business. Try some new project. I started a foundation. My promised land. See what I could do for God in retirement. We're going to start another worship service here at LLBN. Whatever your destiny is, I say, God, there's some walls. And pray that God will knock the walls down and drive out the giants. And watch and see what God will do. Then the Bible says you will not have to fight. God says, I'm going to give it to you. I will do the fighting for you. Deuteronomy 3.22, do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. Exodus 14, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 393. It was not his purpose that they should gain the land by warfare but by strict obedience to the commands. We think we have to fight. We're in a battle with the evil powers of the world, and we have to fight, and we have to mobilize. Sometimes we do things that are not godly, thinking we have to do these things in order to win. 1 so, Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. They were only to march, shout, break trumpets, and God would uh, give them the land. I have a friend named John Dibdaw, was a missionary in Thailand, been president of Walla Walla, is a great, great man. He wrote a book on the Old Testament he called The Holy War Tradition. As he went over the Bible and analyzed all these various holy wars in the Bible, Gideon, Jericho, Jehoshaphat, Ai, he found there was a pattern. If Israel would just trust God, just march and shout, sing in a choir, there would be total victory. They would have no casualties and everyone else would be dead on the other side. On the other hand, if they got self-confident like at AI, go on their own. No God, no prayer, no trusting. We can do this ourselves, small city. They would be wiped out, disaster, and the other army would completely win. In between, there were some places where they worked with God, but they fought and they prayed. They would win, but they would lose people. He said, why not let God? Why not let God fight the battle for us? I told this story to a group the other day. It's a great story. My brothers and I grew up in Thailand. We love this place. We grew up in northern Thailand the first few years in Chiang Mai. And John Dibdahl took our father's place at a certain point and became a missionary in Chiang Mai. Learned to speak Thai beautifully. Wanted to start a tribal school. Now there's a big school, 1,100 students, and we built a church and many buildings for them. But back then, they had to buy land. Ralph Watts is on the board of LLBN lives close by here. He and Dibdahl and these guys flew airplane over the land looking for land. And they found this land. 37 rice farmers all had to sell and sign. And they all signed and we bought the land. What are you going to do with this open virgin raw land? They didn't have that money for someone to come in and carve out the roads and carve out places for the dorms and the buildings and everything they needed. Praying to God. This is your school. This is your promised land. What can we do? He's on his way back from that school. It's about an hour north of Chiang Mai. Been on the road a hundred times. On the way back, had a little accident. I don't know whose fault. Anyway, not the point. He got out of his car, a little fender bender, whatever it was. And he saw that it was a government truck. Got an idea. He said to the government people, he said, uh, I'll fix the car myself. Not your problem. But I want you to give us your back, your bulldozer for four days. We'll pay the driver. We'll pay for the food. 
but we need the backhoe or the bulldozer for four days. They made the deal. He fixed his car for $100. <laughs> and that bulldozer came for four days. They fed him lunch every day and carved out the roads, which are now the roads today. Carved out the soccer field and the place for the dorm and the boys' dorm and the girls' dorm and the ad building. We have built a church there. That whole beautiful campus carved out because of that miracle 35, 40 years ago. It's a great story. He said, you just pray to God. God has ways to make the walls come tumbling down so we can have our promised land. Don't have to fight our own energy to do it all. But God does have us always do something. God has them march and shout. Why does God always have us march and shout? What does that have to do with it? Why does God always have us do something that has seemed to have nothing to do with the actual project? Marching in circles, shouting, breaking trumpet, blowing trumpets, putting Jesus, putting mud on their eyes. What does that have to do with it? Naaman going and dunking under the water seven times. What does water have to do with leprosy? Nothing. And God wants them to know this is all God. Why not have them do nothing at all? Why not just sit down and watch him do it? Why does God always say, I want you to do something? Because that shows free choice. If you make it all God and you don't do anything, then it forces people to say, okay, well, that was pretty clear. That was God. But if you put the mud or if you go under the water, you can say, well, it was under the water. The water has some magic property. Maybe the mud does it. Somehow the shouting. And it's also possible that the people who are doing the things that that was us. It's choice. But what God asks us to do is always really pretty well irrelevant. God wants us to know it's all God. It's all God. The challenge when you and I do something is to begin to think, I think that was me. I'm the preacher. I won those people. I raised the money for that church. I got rid of that sin in my life. I, I, I. No. It's just marching around. God made the walls come tumbling down. God is the one who drove out the demons. And finally, can I just say this? Why do we ever have to lose? These great stories in the Bible seem to make it clear. It would be possible if we followed God all the way to have Jericho after Jericho after Jericho, victory after victory after victory. The Bible says we can go from faith to faith. We can be full of grace and truth. We should never have to lose. We don't have to have a Jericho, then an AI, then another Jericho, then another disaster. We could go from Jericho to Jericho if we would just trust God. Why don't we do it? We try to grab the wheel. We think, I got it now. Grab the wheel and take control for ourselves. And God says, whatever walls are keeping you from your promised land, let me. Let me knock down. You shout and you march. I'll knock the walls down. And he will give you what you want. So we have to wrestle with what is our part? What is God's part? Stuart Tyner, before he died, wrote a book on grace. And he made a list of all the phrases in our culture that we use. We have to do something ourselves. So here's some of them. Work your fingers to your bone. Roll up your sleeves. Just do it. Don't let any grass grow under your feet. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Work like a dog. Leave no stone unturned. The early bird catches the worm. Bring home the bacon. God helps those who help themselves. No, we know again. All those human cliches. It's God. And God alone. Hard to learn, and I have to learn it over and over again. I had a dream not that long ago. And in my dream, I was at the uh, La Sierra Church where I used to be. <clears throat> I was sitting with some other people, and I said, look at that. See those projectors? I raised the money for those. You see the carpet? I raised the 
That night I had a dream. And in the dream, I'm going to heaven. We're all in line, and then we come off the cloud, and we're going into heaven one by one. becomes my turn. And Peter, or whoever it is, asked me, why should I let you into heaven? What did you do? We should let you win. And I began to talk. I did. I raised the money for this. I built that. I preached here. I gave a 1,000 Bible studies. I baptized all these people. I went overseas. I built churches. I, I gave my life. I didn't dance. I didn't go to hardly any movies. I didn't wear jewelry. I didn't drink Cokes. I began to list my resume, my behavior. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and there was Jesus. And there was a cross. Somehow the cross had gone from here up there. There were the holes in his hands where the nails were. There were the crown of thorns. It's all there. And there's a big crowd up there, and they began to sing the song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. I cherish the old rugged cross near the cross. Amazing grace. And in my dream, I knelt at the feet of Jesus and began to cry, I'm so sorry. I know better. I have preached grace all over the world. I know better. Not me. Nothing I did. It was all you. You made the walls come tumbling down. You drove the giants out. It's all you. It's all the cross. God bless you today, middle of our crazy world with the virus that's going everywhere. Hope it hasn't affected you and your family. But if you're searching for your destiny and say, God, it doesn't seem to be happening. God does have a promised land for you. He does have a place for you. He's asking you to step into the water Shout, march, whatever he asks you to do. And know that we have a God who has the power still. He's a big God to make the walls come tumbling down. And we can walk in and claim our kingdom. Claim your kingdom. This is God Talk today. See you next week.